of course being held remotely. A few video conference reminders. Uh, once you start speaking, there will be a slight delay before you are displayed on the screen. To minimize background noise, please click the mute button until it is your turn to speak or ask questions. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next senator until that issue is resolved. I'd like to remind all senators and our witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. You should all have one box on your screens labeled clock that will show you how much time is remaining. At 30 seconds remaining, you should hear a bell that will remind senators that their time has almost expired. To simplify the speaking order process, Senator Brown and I have again agreed to go by seniority for this hearing. After Senator Brown and I give opening statements, we will hear brief introductions of our witnesses from Senators Brown and Portman and Senators Menendez and Booker. We will then proceed to testimony. Um, I'll recognize myself from my opening comment and observe that it appears that I am a chairman for the morning or so. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe it'll be for a full day, that is to be seen. But I wanna thank uh, Chairman Crapo for his service. I think he is not with us at the moment, but I wanna thank him for his leadership of this committee. Uh, in my view, Senator, Senator Crapo set a terrific example for all of us, uh, an example of how to engage in civil debate and treat each other with respect. Uh, I think Senator Crapo has a lot of work that he can be proud of during his tenure as chairman. The work he did on the CARES Act in particular, as the economy was in dire straits last March, to the bipartisan S-2155, the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. And I, I wanna thank Chairman Crapo, and I think I speak for many members of the committee in saying that uh, we're looking forward to his work as the ranking member of the Finance Committee. I also wanna say a quick word expressing my appreciation to Senator Brown uh, we find ourselves, of course, in this somewhat awkward position where um, we have an even split in the Senate, and we, uh, at the moment, uh, have this split on the, uh, on the committee itself. As I mentioned, uh, I'm fully aware that very, very soon, Senator Brown will be the chairman of the committee. I'd like to point out, I feel like we've made the best of the circumstances we're in. We've made progress on the process by which we vet nominees. We've made process on ag progress on processing the nomination, nominations themselves. We've made progress on the budgeting for the committee and how we'll allocate resources. Um, so I appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact that uh, in the past, Senator Brown and I have had a constructive working relationship, whether it's working on things like the opioid crisis, the threat of Asian carps to the Great Lakes that, uh, that we share, uh, and a number of national security threats as well. So. Uh, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with Senator Brown in what will soon be his new role. And as for my uh, opening statement, let me first begin by thanking both nominees for their uh, appearance today, um, more importantly, for their willingness to serve. Dean Cecilia Rouse has had a distinguished career in academia and government. She's very well qualified for the post to which she's been nominated. She has a wealth of expertise in economic research and policy and previous experience on the Council of Economic Advisors. She has multiple degrees from Harvard University and is the current Dean at the Princeton School of Public International Affairs and many, many awards and achievements uh, throughout her distinguished career. I will say I am particularly um, uh, pleased and I admire her advocacy for freedom of speech and diversity of points of view. I think that's uh, an important principle. In 2017, Dr. Rouse wrote, and I quote, I strongly believe, however, that diversity cannot be viewed solely along demographic lines. While we do not always think of diversity in terms of thought or political orientation, we should. It is critical that in our classrooms, boardrooms, and halls of government, people who have different ideological viewpoints interact and work together to debate the important issues of our day, end quote. I think that's a very constructive and much needed sentiment, especially on college campuses. Now, in the spirit of that quote, I wanna recognize that I think I'm gonna disagree with Dr. Rouse far more often than I agree with respect to individual policy prescriptions. But uh, I think she's someone that uh, I can work with. I hope that if she is confirmed, she'll bring a thoughtful, reasoned perspective, and in particular, the willingness to underscore that most policies 
have intended and unintended consequences. There are costs as well as benefits, and the entirety of the likely outcome should be evaluated. Congresswoman Fudge, I want to thank you for your long career in public service and your commitment to community. I appreciate and enjoyed our conversation on Tuesday. But in light of President Biden's repeated calls for unity and pledges to keep ad hominem personal attacks out of political discourse, I do think it's important we look at some of your past rhetoric, just as we should for all nominees before this committee, to understand whether your rhetoric matches President Biden's call for, quote, bringing Americans together. I will say I'm particularly troubled by a number of statements that you've made, Representative Fudge, attacking and disparaging the integrity and motives of Republican officials with whom you have policy disagreements. A few short months ago in September of 2020, you slammed Senate Republican efforts to fill the late Justice Ginsburg seat, and you said, and I quote, those who are bent on choosing her successor have no decency. They have no honor. They have no integrity. And you went on to say, and I quote, they are a disgrace to this nation, end quote. So, Congresswoman, it's, it's one thing to have strongly held views and disagreements, but I'm troubled by this and several other statements because, in my mind, they raise questions about your willingness and ability to work with Republicans if this is your opinion of Republicans. Now, one such category of areas where we need to be able to work together is how you, as HUD Secretary, will implement housing policies that affect millions of Americans. I hope to learn this morning more about how you will address HUD's regulations on affirmatively furthering fair housing, or AFFH. I hope you will avoid returning to the costly Obama-era rule that forced cities to hire expensive consultants and complete lengthy plans that could stretch as long as 800 pages. In my view, now is not the time to impose new unfunded mandates on these communities, which will inevitably drain resources that could be used to support affordable housing and other priorities. I also believe that it's local communities that should be in the driver's seat making decisions uh, for their communities rather than Washington. I also wanna learn how you will address HUD's disparate impact regulations. Under the Obama era disparate impact rule, it seemed that often defendants were guilty until proven innocent. And this turned some housing providers away from providing affordable housing because of the risk of protracted litigation. I hope that HUD's, uh, any new rule that comes from HUD uh, allows claims of discrimination to proceed when they're legitimate and frees housing providers to focus on their mission. It's also important that any such new rule be consistent with the Supreme Court decision in inclusive communities. Finally, let me just make clear um, how I think about uh, an important issue that we're gonna be wrestling with in Congress and it is the jurisdiction of this committee. And that is the question of whether there should be a, a longer eviction moratorium in light of and in the context of the assistance that's already been provided. As a brief reminder, last year, we were in a full-blown financial crisis, a full-blown economic crisis, and we appropriated several trillion, everybody on this committee voted in favor, everyone, I think, in the Senate, voted in favor of several trillion dollars to replace lost income for millions of individuals and businesses. In March, Congress authorized literally hundreds of billions of dollars in direct assistance to individuals in the form of stimulus checks, increased food stamps, extending unemployment eligibility, enhanced unemployment benefits. We all voted for that. And just last month, we did it all over again. Signs are now pointing toward a robust recovery that is underway. It's not complete, but it's underway. The economy grew at 33% in the third quarter. Household balance sheets are extremely strong. The personal savings rate is at an all-time record high and unemployment has dramatically improved from a peak of almost 15% to below 7% now. Just a few weeks ago, we passed another $900 billion bill. And included in that, Congress made $25 billion available exclusively for emergency rental assistance, and that money hasn't been fully distributed yet. And now we're being told that we need to do even more right away. My view is if after all of this historic spending, there are people who have fallen through the cracks, people who have not gotten the assistance they need, then by all means, let's have a conversation about those folks who are in those circumstances. But I think anything we do now should be narrowly targeted to the people who actually need the help rather than universal spending programs that inevitably 
will spend a huge amount of money on people who never experienced any economic hardship. I look forward to the testimony of each of our witnesses, and at this time, I recognize Senator Brown for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a it's an um, honor to be here, and it's a thrill to be here with my friend Congresswoman Marshall Fudge uh, and Dr. Rouse. Um, thank you for joining us too. Uh, Dr. Rouse and I have talked numerous times, but as the case with so many now, haven't haven't yet talked face to face, and look forward to that. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman, Mr. Chairman, for your for your words about the the, the work on this committee. Uh, I would echo your comments about uh, about Mike Crapo working with him on a number of issues. While uh, I, of course, disagreed with him on most major issues, we were able to work together in this committee and, and make a number of good things happen. So thank you. And, and our discussions and relationship during this transition, the, the work that you and I did, uh, Mr. Chairman, on the CARES Act that, that um, essentially kept 12 million people out of poverty until the unemployment benefits and others began to fall away in the summer. Uh, and we should have moved faster. That was a point of disagreement, obviously, with the chairman and me, but we working together on that made a huge difference. So thank you. And uh, we will continue that um, in our new relationship in the next um, a couple of years. Uh, we consider the nominations today of two distinguished public servants. My Congresswoman, Marsha Fudge, Connie and I live in the city of Cleveland in her district. Marsha Fudge to lead the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Dr. Cecilia Rouse to lead the Council of Economic Advisors. Most of us have met with them in remote in most cases. We're impressed with their knowledge. We're impressed with their commitment. We're impressed with their passion to serve, especially during the current public health and economic crisis. Thank you, Congresswoman Fudge and, and Dr. Rouse for that. Our economy is a crossroads. COVID-19 infections are up. New unemployment can, can claims continue to rise. Millions of families are behind on their bills, on rent, on utilities, on mortgage payments. Uh, the chairman's right that there was good economic growth in the third quarter. Uh, the fourth quarter doesn't look so good. This recovery is clearly off track. Uh, much more needs to be done. Secretary, uh, the new Secretary of the Treasury, former chair of the Federal Reserve, the sitting chair of the Federal Reserve, who was known not particularly now, but known as a Republican when he was nominated, both believe that we need to do more and pardon the cliche, not take our foot, not put our foot on the brake. We face a choice. Will we finally marshal all of our country's vast resources and talent to meet this moment? Will we help the families that desperately need it? Um, there are so many of them in every one of our states. Will we help our struggling small businesses to survive? Will we help? Will we work together to get Americans vaccinated, back to school, back to work, back to seeing their grandparents and grandchildren? Or we, will we sit back and watch as millions of Americans face the ever-growing threat of eviction in the middle of a pandemic in the middle of winter? As people drain meager savings accounts or head to payday lenders, as job losses become permanent, as racial and economic inequality get worse? President Biden nominated Congresswoman Fudge and Dr. Rouse to positions that will be essential to determining which path we take during this pandemic and in the years ahead. I can think of no one better to lead us out of this pandemic and into the future than the two women before us today. After a year when Black Americans have endured as many painful reminders of the so many painful reminders of the yawning gap between the promise of our founding ideals and our failure to make that promise real for everyone, two Black women will take leading roles in our economic recovery. This matters on so many levels. It matters for our future that little girls, including Black and Brown girls, see themselves in our leaders, from the Vice President to our two economic leaders sitting in front of this committee. It matters because of the perspective and the life experiences these two women, these two Black women, bring to these jobs. They both have ties to Ohio, one a daughter of Cleveland. I would add her mother is sitting with her. Marcia is, is broadcasting or whatever verb we use um, from uh, Cuyahoga Community College with her family behind her. She will, of course, get the honor of introducing her. But I, I have seen her mother, an activist herself, who brought up Marcia to be the activist. I've seen her around the community. Marcia will, of course, introduce all of them in a moment. The other, Dr. Rouse, uh, with roots deep into the Mahoning Valley in Youngstown, Ohio. Congresswoman Fudge, Dr. Rouse bring a real understanding of the people who make this country work, all people who make this country work, to these jobs. 
If confirmed, Congressman Fudge will lead an agency that supports families and communities that provides housing and safety to people experiencing homelessness from this pandemic. We were just talking offline at the beginning um, about how important this is, especially for homeless veterans. It will help communities rebuild. Today, HUD is grappling with a housing market where millions of families find it harder and harder to afford a decent home. The cost of housing is up. Wages are flat. So many workers have trouble making rent every month without crippling, without crippling stress, or they turn to predatory loans. And the dream of home ownership is increasingly out of reach and with increasing bigger racial divides. None of this started with COVID-19. The affordable housing crisis is the product of decades of conscious policy decisions by both government and corporations. This pandemic has exposed what millions of families in this country already knew that too many people are struggling to get by. Before the United States had our first case of COVID-19, before that, a quarter of all renters in this country were already paying more than half their income for housing. The black ownership rate was nearly as, home ownership rate was nearly as low as it was in 1968 when housing discrimination was legal. Uh, and when uh, our colleague, Senator Romney's father was appointed secretary, was nominated secretary of HUD. HUD should play an essential role in fixing that and expanding opportunity for every zip code and allowing more families to have the peace of mind, the economic security of a safe home they can afford. Congressman Fudge will work to help protect our kids from lead poisoning, still a problem in Cleveland and in Appalachia, Ohio, to restore the promise of fair housing, to give communities the help and resources they need. All of this is a tall order. It's one she's poised to meet. She brings to the job the unique and critical experiences of serving as a mayor for the kind of community that is either overlooked or outright preyed upon by Wall Street and big investors. We can't write off entire swaths of the country, whether it's a coal town or an historic industrial city, whether it's farm country or whether it's an urban neighborhood. This champion of Cleveland understands that. Council of Economic Advisors will also play an integral role both in helping our economy recover and in building a better system out of this pandemic. Dr. Rouse is exactly whom we need at the helm. If confirmed, she will help direct our nation's economic policy to put Americans back to work, fighting for better jobs with higher wages. Millions of Americans are still out of work. Those job losses have disproportionately fallen on low-income workers, black and brown workers, and women. At the same time, essential workers are making are, are risking their health to go to work. Corporations still refuse to pay so many of them a living wage. It's all part of the corporate business model that treats American workers as expendable instead of essential, as we call them, to this country's success. For decades, workers' wages have remained stagnant while CEO pay has skyrocketed. skyrocketed. Building back better means taking on that system and creating an economy with a growing, thriving middle class. It won't be the first time Dr. Rouse has helped us weather a crisis. She served on the Council of Economic Advisors a dozen years ago during the Great Recession. Dr. Rouse has spent her career focusing on workers, ensuring this economy works for everyone, her experience and leadership will guide this administration and Congress in formulating the policies that help revive our economy so that it works for all Americans. And Dr. Ryan and Dr. Rouse and Congresswoman Fudge will look at how we can protect families from climate change while seizing opportunities to create new jobs, to advance environmental justice, to grow new industries. Making our homes and communities more energy efficient isn't just necessary for our future. It's the kind of investment that will put people back to work at jobs that can't be outsourced. We face great challenges. These are extraordinary times. I look forward to hearing how each of you will help chart the course out of this pandemic and build a brighter future in the years ahead. Um, as Chair, I ask unanimous consent to um, submit a number of letters for the record in support of these two nominees. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. So uh, at this time, our colleagues from Ohio and New Jersey uh, have indicated they'd like to introduce the nominees from their home states. Um, Senator Brown, um, as the senior senator from Ohio, did you have anything you wanted to add by way of introduction to Congresswoman? Yeah, let me just have a couple of words, and I will turn sure. it to my colleague, Senator Portman, for sure. And I, I've said much about Marsha already. I mentioned her mother here, and she's she's um, uh, calling in. She's um, with us from uh, our great community college, I believe the downtown campus, although I don't know which campus she's on of Tri-C, 
Uh, she's a proud daughter of Ohio. She was born in Cleveland. She grew up in our state. She graduated from the Ohio State University in Cleveland Marshall College of Law, a long and distinguished career in public service. Uh, she was um, in, the, in the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office, Chief of Staff to the Trailblazing, our friend Stephanie tubbs Joan, Mayor of Warrensville Heights. I remember still the long meeting I had in her office uh, back in, I believe, 2005. Uh, she served as national president of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. Senator Portman and I have been to a number of uh, soror of Delta reunions with the Redcoats in the basement of Rayburn. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, she's been a leader in Congress as past chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. We know her outspokenness on civil rights, on women's rights, on human rights. She saw up close how lenders preyed on families. Everyone in this committee has heard me talk about my zip code, 44105, more foreclosures there in the first half of 2007 than anywhere in the country. She was serving as mayor then less than probably seven or eight miles from there in Warrensville Heights. She represents my zip code and, and those communities in the Congress now. She's dedicated her career fighting for these families and the communities they live in. I'm excited to work with her as the future chair of the Banking Housing Committee on Housing Issues. Uh, my pleasure to introduce Marsha Fudge and turn it to my, my friend, Senator Portman. Senator Portman, you're recognized to uh, make your comments. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Toomey and Chairman to be Brown and uh, Senator Crapo and others who, who, who might be here from the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to introduce a friend of mine. Uh, before I do, I want to tell her that I think it's great she's at uh, an amazing community college, Tri-C. I hope Dr. Johnson is taking good care of you. And I uh, understand that Mrs. Marion Safford is with you, uh, who is uh, a distinguished uh, public servant in her own way, although not in elected office, and happens to be 89-year-old uh, a mother of yours. Is that correct? Yeah, well, con congratulations uh, to you and to your family for this nomination. And uh, I, I'm here just to say that I'm, I'm, I'm proud that you're choosing to step up. Um, you're a friend of mine. We've worked together. Uh, you do have a distinguished career and you have worked on housing policy issues throughout your entire public policy career. Um, you graduated from Ohio State, earned a law degree from Cleveland State. Uh, you were a Cuyahoga County prosecutor, assistant prosecutor. You were the first African-American and first female mayor of Warrensville Heights. And there you worked on housing issues. Uh, I'm told that affordable housing was one of your policy objectives there and you were successful in expanding that. Since being elected to the House of Representatives in 2008, um, succeeding um, another friend of mine who was, uh, you know, very successful member of Congress who was able to work on both sides of the aisle, uh, Stephanie Tubbs Jones, uh, you have gone on to serve the people of Cleveland and 11th District with a substantial uh, and impressive work ethic, um, as I have seen. Uh, certainly, compassion for your constituents, many of whom live in communities where there's not good access to housing. Uh, or jobs um, and where poverty uh, is an issue. My experience and that of respected members of the Cleveland community who I know well is that you have worked collaboratively to tackle these challenges, working across party lines, including even with your Republican Senator now and again, and with the business community to help your constituents. Uh, of course, you were also chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and uh, they made you chair because they recognize your leadership capabilities. Uh, in our time in Congress together, we've worked on a number of things that are bicameral, bipartisan, including teaming up to increase college access for low-income students through our Go to High School, Go to College Act, which incentivizes students to earn college credits in high school through the Pell Grant program. In 2014, after a HUD rule uh, that I thought was a bureaucratic rule that didn't make much sense, uh, uh, cut off some Cleveland area families from critical housing and social services. Your office uh, and my office and you and I worked together to ensure that HUD worked with Cuyahoga County and with City Mission in particular in Cleveland so that struggling residents could continue to have access to those vital services. And we were successful in working with HUD on that. So I know you've had experiences working with the, uh, with the HUD bureaucracy. Uh, during this healthcare and economic crisis, she's continued to be a leader in fighting for housing security by 
co-sponsoring amendments to the Bipartisan CARES Act that ensured those affected by the pandemic were not unfairly evicted from their homes or foreclosed on due to missed rent or mortgage payments. Just as important as uh, her experience is, in my view, is who she is as a person. And uh, I don't always agree with Marsha on policy. She certainly doesn't always agree with me, but I can speak to her integrity, her commitment to justice and the strength of her character. Um, I think she's got a public servant's heart. I think she's in it for the right reasons. And um, again, I'm, I'm encouraged that she's willing to step up to take on this new responsibility, which is uh, not always easy in these times. Um, as head of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, she will have an important job of leading efforts to ensure affordable quality housing is within reach of all Americans. This is something we all hope for. It's critical as our nation continues to face a housing crisis compounded by the healthcare and economic crises caused by COVID-19. I, I noticed this morning, there was a new report on economic growth. Uh, fourth quarter growth was substantial over 4%. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, housing became any more affordable. <laughs> in a way, I think as we begin to come out of this pandemic, uh, we're gonna get back as we start to grow the economy again, which all of us hope for, and I believe will happen, into the same issue we, we have been in, which is a lack of affordable housing in my state of Ohio and, and around the country. So I know Representative Fudge shares that concern and will be focused on that. Uh, I know she also shares this committee's commitment to addressing the eviction crisis we've got right now and how do you, how do you deal with that in the middle of a pandemic? It's a tough issue. Um, and um, you, know, you wanna be sure that landlords, uh, particularly our small landlords around the state of Ohio and elsewhere uh, aren't, aren't left uh, without the resources they need to be able to be successful, but also we need to be sure we're dealing with the reality of uh, people not being able to pay rent in some cases and avoiding those evictions, which cause so much uh, pain and uh, inefficiency in our system. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me the privilege of introducing uh, Representative Fudge. Uh, I look forward to hearing from her this morning uh, and then uh, the opportunity to vote for her on the United States Senate floor. Thank you, thank Senator you. Portman. Uh, Senator Menendez, you are recognized to introduce Dean Rouse. Well, well thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and as a senior member of the committee, I look forward to working with you and incoming Chairman Brown uh, on an important uh, a set of agendas that I know the committee will be pursuing. And uh, today, it's a sincere honor to introduce Dr. Cecilia Elena Rouse as President Biden's nominee for the chair of the Presidential Council of Economic Advisors. Now, this isn't the first time I've introduced Dr. Rouse uh, to this committee. I had the same honor back in 2009 when President Obama nominated her to the Council of Economic Advisors during the height of the Great Recession. And as a member of the council, Dr. Rouse helped uh, devise strategies to strengthen our labor market and steer our country out of what at the time was known and uh, we realized was the worst economic crisis since uh, the Great depression. Now she is once again being called on by a president to serve our nation in an hour of even greater pearl and uncertainty, this time as chair. When she is confirmed, Dr. Rouse will be the first African-American woman to chair the President's Council on Economic Advisors. Yet aside from the historic nature of her nomination, Dr. Rouse's experience in both uh, the Obama and Clinton administrations, as well as her academic expertise, make her eminently qualified for this role. Uh, as you pointed out, she ser currently serves as the Dean of the Pub Princeton School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University, one of New Jersey's most prestigious and nationally renowned institutions. Her primary research and teaching interests are in labor economics with a particular focus on the economics of education. Indeed, Dr. Rouse has often said that she first became interested in economics as a tool to expand opportunity and create positive social change. Uh, she has studied the economic benefits of community college attendance, the effect of financial age on college matriculation, the impact of student loan debt on graduates entering the job market. She's also a strong advocate for reducing racial wealth inequality, an important priority as we grapple with the pandemic that has disproportionately devastated minority communities. 
Dr. Rouse is also a senior editor of The Future of Children and has served as an editor of the Journal of Labor Economics. Additionally, she is the founding director of the Princeton University Education Research Section and former director of the Industrial Relations Section. I believe Dr. Rouse has the right experience and insight to help chart a path for our country out of this crisis and towards a brighter, more equitable, and more prosperous future for all Americans. And I certainly will be urging my colleagues, both on the committee and in the Senate, to support her swift confirmation as chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. And I look forward to working with her to get our economy back on track and bring much needed change and equity to our nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Menendez. Uh, Senator Booker, you are recognized to uh, introduce Dean Rouse. Uh, Chairman, I, I'm grateful for you and uh, Senator Brown as well uh, for your leadership and for allowing me these moments of introductions for Dr. Rouse. If I may tread upon your grace, um, uh, it is very hard for me to see uh, Martha Fudge um, uh, sitting before you without uh, uh, putting on the record uh, just a touch of truth about her. Uh, I've been in the Senate for seven years, and it is not an overstatement to say uh, that one of my most invaluable colleagues and friends in that seven years is Martha Fudge. Uh, she is an extraordinary woman who has a deep uh, kindness at her soul. Uh, and many of us uh, who know her, she has been a big sister. Uh, she has been a mentor. And that is most certainly true uh, in my life. And I know she, like me, was a former mayor. Uh, as a mayor, you, you get the skill of finding ways to bring people together uh, to create common ground. I saw those skills uh, on display when she was the chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus, which is a very diverse group but also her ability uh, from that position to work across the aisle, find common ground and get things done. And so I know this committee will deal a lot with her should she be confirmed. And I think uh, um, as was said by Senator uh, Portman, uh, uh, you will find in her a goodness, a decency, uh, and, and, and God willing, a friendship that I hope this committee on both sides of the aisle uh, recognizes uh, that it can't, could be for you as it has been for me one of the most valuable relationships I have. The only warning I'll give about her is don't try to serve her vegan food like I did. Uh, it's the only time I, I've seen her have harsh language to me. Um, and now uh, uh, I'd like to uh, have the honor of just saying quickly some remarks about uh, uh, Dr. Rouse, uh, who is President Biden's uh, nominee for the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. What a privilege it is uh, to be able to uh, affirm what has already been said by my senior Senator Menendez, uh, if confirmed, Dr. Rouse will be uh, tasked with an enormous uh, challenge of helping to craft and guide our nation's economic policy at a time of unprecedented economic crisis. Uh, across the country, uh, this committee knows tens of millions of Americans have lost their jobs, millions of our country, uh, country men and women in, in this wealthy nation have been pushed into poverty, food insecurity, uh, with women especially suffering and challenges being seen amongst people of color and women of color in, partic in particular. Uh, the impact of this uh, economic crisis has been savage and unequal and has compounded a lot of the realities uh, that were already a grieve grievous in our country. Uh, systemic inequality, uh, historic uh, disinvestment uh, in, in black and brown communities like the one I, I live in. Uh, the Washington Post reported it most succinctly, and they said that the COVID-19 recession is the most unequal in modern uh, U.S. history. Uh, the economic crisis and the resultant attendant uh, health crisis created by this pandemic have made clear how interconnected the challenges are that we face. And these crises have also made clear how necessary it is for bold action and bold leadership. Uh, we must have uh, people with the kind of competency, qualifications, and commitment that Dr. Rouse has. If confirmed, I strongly believe that Dr. Rouse will offer the kind of leadership, vision, and action needed to enact an economic agenda that really prioritizes 
working families, that rebuilds our economy in an inclusive way and addresses systemic barriers that have driven what is a real threat to our society as we know it, which is the wealth and economic inequalities that have grown worse over my lifetime. I don't just say this because uh, Senator Menendez, as he noted, that Dr. Rouse uh, is a proud New Jerseyan, Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs uh, to Princeton University. But Dr. Rouse is just renowned in her field. Uh, she is a well-known and celebrated labor economist, a leader in academia and in the study of the economic impact of, of diversity and inclusion and knowing that these are elements that are not nice to talk about, but actually add to the economic strength of organizations in our country, public and private alike. She's a public servant who has served as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Obama-Biden administration and on the National Economic Council in the Clinton administration as special assistant to President Clinton. If confirmed, Dr. Rouse will serve as the first African-American and fourth woman to lead the Council of Economic Advisors since its establishment 74 years ago. If the committee moves her forward, it will be historic in that sense. She will not just make history if confirmed though. I am confident uh, she will help to shape a future that is more resonant with our common values as a people, that she will be a force to making our nation bend the arc of that moral universe more towards liberty and justice for all. I urge my colleagues to swiftly confirm Dr. Rouse's nomination. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Senator Booker. I will now swear in the nominees. Uh, because of the remote format of today's hearing, I will swear in each nominee, each nominee individually. Congresswoman Fudge, will you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Do you agree to appear and testify before any duly constituted committee of the Senate? Uh, Congresswoman Fudge, can you hear me? Having a little trouble with your audio. Okay, what? Why don't we work on that technical uh, challenge here and I will uh, move on and ask Dr. Rouse if you will please rise and raise your right hand. Dr. Rouse, do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. And do you agree to appear and testify before any duly constituted committee of the Senate? I do. You may sit down. Congresswoman Fudge, are, are you able to hear me? We we do not uh, we cannot hear your audio. Okay, so I was going to recognize you first, Congresswoman Fudge, but because we have this technical difficulty, I'm going to go to Dr. Rouse for her opening statement, and then we'll hopefully we'll have gotten the problem solved in the meantime. But uh, we're not able to hear you. Can you hear me now, sir? Uh, now I can hear you. Yes. Um, so um, I, I'm sorry to uh, impose on you again, but it, but we couldn't hear your response to the second question in the oath. So if, if you don't mind, please standing, uh, raise your right hand again. Uh, and the question is, do you agree to appear and testify before any duly constituted committee of the Senate? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. You may sit down. Uh, each of your written statements will be made a part of the record in their entirety. Congresswoman Fudge, please proceed with your statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. If, if I may, Mr. Chairman, may I introduce my family that is with me today? Absolutely, you may. Thank you. You've heard much about my mother today, but I'm gonna have her wave at you uh, if, if they could see her. And this is the rest of all of my family is here, my, my aunts, my stepfather, all of my cousins and dear friends. So I just wanted you to be aware that we are all here together. I'm very, very close to my family and I'm pleased that they could be with me today. Uh, and to my senators, uh, thank you for your kind words and certainly for your friendship. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, I thank President Biden for nominating me to serve as the 18th Secretary of Housing and Urban Development and will do everything possible 
to ensure that every American has a roof over their head. The housing issues our nation faces are real, varied, and touch all of us. I'm a strong believer in the department's programs and its mission, especially with regard to serving those who face the greatest need. Senators, I have dedicated my entire life to public service and to working to help low-income families, seniors, and communities. I believe I am up to the challenge that is before me. As mayor of Warrensville Heights, Ohio, I saw firsthand the need for economic development and affordable housing. We improved the city's tax base and expanded affordable housing opportunities. As a member of Congress, I tackled the unique challenges of my district, working with my delegation and across the aisle. Our housing issues do not fit into a cookie cutter mold. And I know that the same is true in each of your states. We need policies and programs that can adapt to meet your unique housing challenges. And I would very much like to work with each of you to find the right answers for your states. It bears mentioning, particularly in this moment of crisis, that HUD, perhaps more than any other department, exists to serve the most vulnerable people in America. That mandate matters a great deal to me. It is consistent with my own values, and it is precisely what has always motivated me to service. It is estimated that on any given night in 2019, more than 500,000 people experienced homelessness in America. That's a devastating statistic. Even before you consider the reality of what COVID-19 has done to exacerbate this crisis. According to one study, 21 million Americans currently pay more than 30% of their income on housing because of lost income and unemployment due to COVID-19. I in one in five renters and one in 10 homeowners with a mortgage are behind in their housing payments. Native housing is also in crisis with far too many families living in substandard and overcrowded housing conditions on reservations. Although Congress provided 25 billion in rental assistance and the CDC extended the eviction moratorium, this is not enough at a time when tens of millions of Americans are behind on rent. Almost 3 million homeowners are currently in forbearance and another 800,000 borrowers are delinquent. Much like COVID-19, the housing crisis isn't isolated by geography. It is the daily reality for tens of millions of our fellow Americans, people in blue states and red states, in cities and small towns. My first priority as secretary would be to alleviate that crisis and get people the support they need to come back from the edge. We need to expand resources for HUD's programs to people who are eligible. Today, according to a 2017 study, only one out of five eligible households receive housing assistance. We need to deliver on the administration's commitments on improving the quality, safety, and accessibility of affordable housing and building 1.5 million new affordable homes. We need to make the dream of home ownership a reality and the security and wealth creation that comes with it. It needs to be a reality for all Americans. That will require us to end discriminatory practices in the housing market and ensure that our fair housing rules are doing what they are intended to do, opening the door for families, especially families of color who have been systematically kept out, of the, kept out in the cold across generations to buy homes and punch their ticket to the middle class. There are so many issues we need to come together to address, everything from bringing capital back to disinvested communities to increasing energy efficiency in housing, to dealing with the dangers of lead-based paint, to taking on our crisis of homelessness with compassion and resolve. These are only some of the challenges, and I know that many of you have additional priorities as well. These problems are urgent, but they are not beyond our capacity to solve. The only way we will meet them is by working together. And to that end, I pledge this. If I have the honor of being confirmed, I will be accessible to you, I will listen to you, and I will be a partner to you to solve the housing challenges our constituents are facing back home. I expect you to hold me accountable. I welcome the accountability, and I will always strive to be a transparent and good faith partner as we work together to do the vitally important work we're all here to do, helping families in need. I thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman Fudge. Dean Rouse, please proceed. 
Thank you. And thank you, Senator Menendez and Senator Booker for the generous introductions. Chair Toomey, incoming Chairman Brown, and members of the committee, it is an honor to appear before you today. The last time I was before this committee was in 2009 for my confirmation hearing to become a member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. I was accompanied by many members of my family. This is a very different time. And while they're not here today, they are with me in spirit. I thank them for the love and support they provided in helping me on the path that has led me before you today. That path began in the early 1980s during what was at the time, one of the worst spikes in unemployment our country had experienced since the 1930s. I was a freshman in college taking my first economics class. Okay, I was there because my wise mother told me to take an econ class. But what really piqued my interest was unemployment. When I could see how classroom material could be applied to the world outside and the millions who were experiencing in real time, the effects of a struggling economy. I was drawn to the discipline because I wanted to know why this was happening. Why had jobs disappeared and what could be done to bring them back? I focused my work on the labor market and in particular on the impact of education on people's job prospects, ways to tear down barriers to job growth and policies to make it possible for more people to achieve long lasting economic security. Since then, I've had the honor of working on these important issues in academia and the public sector. Today, our country is living through the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Millions of families have had their lives turned upside down. The economic security they've worked so hard to build eroded almost overnight by the economic impact of the pandemic. Far too many have slipped through our freight safety net into hardship and hopelessness. And structural inequities that have always existed within our economy have not just been ex exposed, but exacerbated their impact more devastating than ever before. We must take action to shepherd our nation's economy back into solid footing. But as deeply distressing as this pandemic and economic fallout have been, it is also an opportunity to rebuild the economy better than it was before, making it work for everyone by increasing the availability of fulfilling jobs and leaving no one vulnerable to falling through the cracks. President Biden and Vice President Harris have made these the core values of their Build Back Better agenda. If confirmed, my job will be to provide them with objective economic guidance, recommendations rooted in fact and evidence to help them achieve those important goals. As important as it is for the CEA to interpret and translate data and academic research, it is also vital that we utilize the right data. Too often, economists focus on average outcomes instead of examining a range of outcomes. As a result, our analyses tell us about average economic growth and the middle of the distribution, but as our economy grows more and more unequal, that analysis fails to capture the experience of the many people who are left behind, particularly people of color. Therefore, one of my priorities as chair will be to try to understand how policies will impact all in our country as we strive to ensure the economy works for everyone. Equally important is having analysis conducted by economists who specialize in a variety of fields. If confirmed, I will staff the CEA with a well-rounded team ready to address the incredible breadth of challenges we face. To close, I am honored to be nominated for this position. It would allow me to work on issues close to my heart and so critical in this current crisis. A good paying, fulfilling job has always been the key to building economic security. Today, we are seeing the immense pain caused when our economy fails to fulfill that promise. But I believe there is much we can do to strengthen the position of everyone and cross this incredible country of ours. If confirmed, I will work closely with you on these important priorities. I will do so regardless of your party affiliation, your approach to various policies, or your opinion of the administration's efforts. Economists are trained to gather and analyze information and consider innovative perspectives. That is how I will approach this job and my door will always be open. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Rouse. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning and remind my colleagues that uh, we have a lot of members on this committee and uh, we really need to try to stick to this clock. Um, Congresswoman Fudge, to go back to your quote from September of 2020, you referred to Republicans who wanted to fill Justice Ginsburg seat which is to say every single Republican senator, as having no decency, no honor, no integrity, and as a disgrace to the nation. Those are quotes. Do you stand by that statement? 
let, let me first say, Senator, that I think uh, there are more to those quotes, but let me just suggest that I have always uh, been able to work across the aisle. I have a reputation that shows my bipartisanship. Yes, I do listen to my constituents and sometimes I am a little passionate about things. Is my tone pitch perfect all the time? It is not, uh, but I do know this that I have the ability and the capacity to work with Republicans, uh, and I intend to do just that, and that is my commitment to you. Um, in June of last year, while discussing Republican policing reform efforts, you said in part that if Republicans, quote, want to save face and let this country know that they care even a little bit about people of color, which I don't believe they do, but if they want to try, I want to listen. Do you really believe that Republicans don't care even a little bit about people of color? I think the latter part of my statement is my true feeling. I, if they do, I do want to listen. I listen. I have always listened. I am one of the most bipartisan members in the House of Representatives. And I think that if you would check that, my record would reflect that. Um, let me uh, ask you about the uh, uh, the issue of uh, deploying the APA and complying with it. Congresswoman Fudge, President Biden, as you probably know, has directed the HUD secretary to examine the effects of the HUD's 2020 disparate impact rule. Uh, if you're confirmed and you uh, carry out that uh, examination, if you conclude that revisions to the rule are in fact needed, will you comply with the APA and go through a robust notice and comment rulemaking rather than merely trying to revert automatically back to the previous rule? That's a, that's a great question, Senator. I'm going to follow the law and follow the rules. You don't ever have to worry about that. That is my commitment to you. So there is, there is some flexibility within the APA, as you probably know. Uh, what I'm specifically um, interested in is whether you're willing to go through the notice and comment period so that you can get as much input as possible and make the most informed judgment going forward. Is that something you're willing to do? It is something I'm certainly willing to consider, sir, yes. Okay. Um, and I, I assume that you would ensure that any revisions that you would uh, make would be consistent with the Supreme Court ruling in the inclusive communities decision? No question about it. I, again, will support the law, but if I may, Senator? Yeah. I, I, I listened to your opening statement and you were talking about unintended consequences. I kind of look at the disparate impact rule the same way. You know, we do things oftentimes not intending to be discriminatory, but our effect is discriminatory. I, I, I understand that, and that is worthy of a, a whole lengthy conversation, but in the interest of keeping to my five minute limit, I just wanna to touch on uh, another issue if I could, and that is the um, mutual mortgage insurance fund. Um, again, uh, this is a, a fund that protects taxpayers from uh, losses. Um, if you decide to make changes, specifically any lowering of the premiums for that fund, will you commit to making sure that you do that in a collaborative fashion with members of Congress? Uh, you have my commitment. Not only will, if I'm, if, if, if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed, I will talk to the, to the staff uh, at HUD, we will figure out what the status is right now and come back to you to have discussions about where we should go from there. You have Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rouse, uh, I appreciated our conversation the other day. Yes. I enjoyed the discussion. I just want to stress, um, well, maybe I, I would just ask, um, is it your view that when the government mandates a certain economic policy, it is often the case that there are unintended consequences and costs to policies that might have, that might also have benefits. Uh, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Senator. What, what is important is that when the government imposes mandates, that it does so completely understanding the potential benefits of such mandates, as well as the costs. And to undertake those mandates where the, the benefits would outweigh the costs. So if there's really, so lunch, the most important thing is to understand both costs and benefits. Great, thank you, um, Senator Brown. I, um, I, I want to, I, first of all, I, I think the fact that Senator Portman called uh, Congressman Fudge and offered to 
co-introduce him or introduce him tells you a lot about her bipartisan work. And uh, we, um, you know, we all we all are outspoken about our views. Marsha is, I am, Pat Toomey is, Rob Portman is, and I've just always found Congressman Fudge to to work with me, to work with uh, most of our House delegation in Ohio. It overwhelmingly is Republican, and she works with them, and she uh, represents her constituents with with fervor and passion through all of that. I, let me start with um, Congresswoman Fudge. Uh, the, as you know, before this pandemic, as you point out, Dr. Rouse pointed out in both your testimonies, uh, families in, in our country were struggling to make rent um, prior to the pandemic. There were nearly a million evictions every year prior to this. We know the pandemic, as you both said, if pushed so many millions of families over the edge. That was one of the proud, that's one of the reasons I'm so proud of what we did with the CARES Act, especially if we had kept it going, because we kept 12 million people out of poverty. Um, Congressman Fudge, the emergency funds Congress provided, it provided in December were, were just a down payment. Um, as President Biden and many of us in Congress have said, we have to do more to prevent waves of foreclosures and evictions to stop millions of people from taking a, a permanent financial hit because of the crisis. Just give us a, a, a short version of what you will do through HUD to ensure that families don't lose their homes. Thank you so much, Senator. You know, one of the things we must do is stabilize the market. We cannot afford to have people, millions of people evicted from their homes or their apartments because the problem then just gets worse. It doesn't get better. And I understand that there are some who believe that we are uh, doing more than we should, but I believe we are not doing enough. On any given day, we have 8 million people who need housing. So not only do we need to protect those who are currently in housing, but we need to ensure that those who, were, who are without housing get it. And so one of the things that we have to talk about is finding ways to expand our inventory of low and moderate income housing. We have to keep people in public housing who are already there. We need to expand housing choice vouchers so that we can at least start to uh, reduce the numbers of people who are paying exorbitant amounts of money for rent. We also need to find ways to assist people who want to build low income and affordable housing. And we do that through many things. But lastly, and most importantly, we want to be sure that FHA uh, is available for people who want to take the next step. So that may be helping with down payment assistance. It may, it may mean reducing rents. Whatever it takes, we cannot afford to allow people in the midst of, an, of a pandemic to be put in the streets. I just believe that extraordinary times take extraordinary action, and we are in extraordinary times, Senator. Thank you, Congressman. Let me, let me ask you a, a quick up or down question. In the past four years, the Trump administration, I mean, a yes or no question, the Trump administration tried to undo HUD's mission to enforce fair housing laws. You and I have talked about that a lot. Earlier this week, the president announced several executive orders and plans to begin to reverse these policies and finally work to fulfill the promises of the Fair Housing Act. My question, if confirmed, will you commit to fully enforce fair housing laws? Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is just, a, I'll close with a, a, a statement both to Dr. Rouse and to Congresswoman Fudge. Uh, cities like Cleveland still have far too many homes that, that expose children to dangerous lead paint. In 2019, researchers found there were elementary schools and, and um, Marsha Fudge is in my hometown of Cleveland where more than a third of kindergartners had elevated high levels of blood uh, levels, high elevated lead levels in their blood. Five and six year olds disproportionately, of course, as we know, children of color. We start them out in life with such a disadvantage. Dr. Rouse, you're a researcher who studies education uh, and its connection to work. You know the cost, both both moral and economic, that incur that occurs when our fellow citizens are unable to achieve their full potential, especially when it starts in that year. We know how to keep kids safe from lead poisoning. We're seeing some promising steps in Cleveland and elsewhere. My colleague, Senator Reed, the most senior member of this committee, has worked on this in his appropriations role also. We just haven't had the public collective political will to do it. I hope that that's going to change. I look forward to working with both of you, Dr. Rouse and Congresswoman Fudge, to, to fully protect our kids from lead and other threats, threats to their health. Uh, it's hard to imagine anything so important. 
Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to Congresswoman uh, Fudge, as well as uh, Dr. Rouse. Uh, thank you for your willingness to serve our country, and I look forward to having a meaningful dialogue about some of the issues that will be very important to the nation. And frankly, uh, Congressman Fudge, I, I have respect for you and, and appreciation for your willingness to serve. And I think you and I are philosophically disjointed on, on, on a number of issues, but your willingness to serve is, is strong. I do want to uh, talk a little bit about some of the previous comments that you've made about the Republican Party as it relates to race. That I think uh, I, I can't say that it, your comments were taken out of context. I would simply say that I would love to have a longer conversation about how effective the Republican Party has been on meeting some of the needs of the most vulnerable people in this country, specifically minorities, over the last several years. I have certainly play, played a role in making sure that some of the priorities that impacts our community uh, have been brought to the surface, to the top, and have been prioritized by the Republican Party. And just to name a few, and I'm going to get to the question that I have, uh, highest level of funding for HBCUs in the history of this country, permanent funding for the first time in the history of the country, the lowest unemployment rate ever recorded pre-pandemic in the history of the country for African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, 60-year uh, low for women as well, research on rare blood diseases to include sickle cell anemia, criminal justice reform that actually, frankly, made up for some of the challenges of Mr. Biden, President Biden's 1994 law, increases in labor force participation rate. I believe at 2016, the home ownership for African Americans was around 41%. Today, it's around 46%, and that's even after the dip of the pandemic. Uh, poverty at the lowest rate recorded since 1959, uh, aid to black farmers that I've worked on through heirs property, focusing on heirs property as a real issue. Uh, coming from the South, I know and understand and appreciate the value of allowing African American farmers to use heirs' property in a way to uh, obtain a farm number so that they can participate uh, fully in the USDA. It's really important. And finally, opportunity zones that are having a positive, strong impact throughout this country. And frankly, the TCJA certainly was passed on a partisan level only, but the opportunity zone legislation is legislation that was co-sponsored by Cory Booker and House members that are Democrats and Republicans. And to that end, I, I hope, and my question for you is, can I count on you to take serious the opportunity to use opportunity zones as a way of meeting some of the challenging needs that we have from a housing stock around the country? Uh, thank you so much, Senator Scott. It's nice to see you, actually. Yes, ma'am. It's a pleasure. And, and it is my pleasure to have a conversation with you about uh, what you have done as it relates to minority communities and communities uh, that are hurting. It would indeed be something that I'd like to discuss with you. As it relates to opportunity zones, I will take seriously, of course, uh, opportunity zones. Certainly, I would like to, if, if confirmed, to get into the office and look at how many jobs have been created, how many sustainable jobs have been created, what the cost has been. I mean, I think that you have to be driven by data. And I will absolutely take it seriously. I know it's something important to you and would be happy to have those conversations with you going forward. Thank you. I will note that uh, in Opportunity Zones, they are responsible for helping, even in uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, 50 incarcerated individuals in Columbus find housing, 95 units of workforce housing, 100 new jobs in Cleveland, in my state, uh, Hampton County, a very poor rural community, 1,500 jobs in a community that only has 5,000 jobs brought to them by Opportunity Zones. And that continues throughout major cities from Birmingham to Rock Hill, South Carolina, where we're using Opportunity Zones to really challenge the playing field for those folks who have been left out and who are desperate for housing. Uh, speaking of being desperate for housing, about 22 million Americans live in manufactured housing throughout this country, one in five in South Carolina. The definition of manufacturing housing is no longer the trailers that people come to mind. Manufacturing housing has a diversity within its uh, construct, and I would love to hear that you have an interest and in, in, in perhaps even a passion for making sure that we continue to prioritize manufacturing housing as one of the ways for us to lower the cost and make more homeowners, uh, make home ownership more possible for more Americans. Have you done any homework on the manufacturing housing? And I'd love to hear your thoughts on using that to meet some of the needs that we have throughout the community. 
Yes, I have. As a matter of fact, thank you, Senator, for the question. I have done research. I have actually had conversations with those who build manufactured housing. I think it's an outstanding option. The cost is about seventy-eight to one hundred thousand dollars a home. It is affordable. It is something we can do rapidly. I am one hundred percent supportive of looking more into how we incorporate uh, manufactured housing. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, thank you, you, Senator Scott. Senator Reed. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to welcome Congresswoman Fudge and Dr. Rouse uh, to the hearing. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rouse, thank you for your service to Rhode Island as a member of the Board of Trustees of URI, so go Rhodey. Uh, and I uh, want to say to uh, the Congresswoman, thank you for your great work in the Congress. Uh, we've all touched upon affordable housing, uh, and sometimes we see it simply as a, the human cost, which is tremendous. Uh, but there's a definite economic cost, too, which should be an incentive to build more affordable housing. In Rhode Island, for example, 90% of our homeless individuals are on Medicaid, and uh, their cost per annum is about $14,000. That's 80% more than the overall average Medicaid recipient. So when you address the affordable housing issue, I hope you will uh, point out consistently the economic benefits of affordable housing as well as the, the human cost. And any comments I'd appreciate, Congresswoman. Yes, and, and, and thank you, Senator, for the conversation we've had uh, to discuss some of the issues that I know are important to you. Um, the economic costs are in the trillions. I mean, if you look at the data, the data shows that it is an economic deterrent to not have people in housing. When you look at the lost jobs, the lost income, and the lost development opportunities, it is more difficult for people to get to work. So we lose so much when we don't have decent, affordable public housing. And the cost of homelessness is just skyrocketing. It was bad before we ever addressed COVID. Now what we have found out is that the cost of care for homeless people is skyrocketing as a result of COVID because homeless people tend to be sicker. Homeless people tend to contract the disease more often. Poorer people or people who live in public housing tend to, con to contract the disease more often. And so it is a very costly proposition, just physically as well as economical. Well, let me uh, thank you very much, Congresswoman. But let me associate myself also with uh, uh, Senator Brown's comments on lead. Uh, we have had a, a same problem Rhode Island as you've had in Cleveland because we probably have about the same age of housing. Uh, I've worked very close with uh, Chairman Collins on the Appropriations Committee to get funding for, for lead. But one of the things I'd just like to point out is you recognize very clearly with the pandemic, more particularly low income people are spending time crowded in a home which might have lead problems. So the, the problem is even more acute today because of the pandemic, and we have to apply the resources to that. I, I, I know you agree, but I just want to get that on the record. Yes, thank, thank you. I agree 100 percent. Thank you. Uh, again, Dr. Rouse, uh, thank you for your help to Rhode Island. As I said before, go Rhodey. Senator Toomey and I both have a certain ties to the state, <laughs> so we appreciate your help to the university. One issue I want to raise in my brief time remaining is uh, automatic stabilizers for unemployment insurance. Uh, in Rhode Island, at the last recession, you noticed, as you were working in the administration, that some states came out first so that the overall national picture looked pretty good, but Rhode Island and Nevada were going head-to-head -head every week as who would have the highest unemployment rate at about 12%. So as we go forward, I would hope you would consider automatic stabilizers so that certain parts of the country, and it's not one region perhaps, it's based on lots of factors, but would not be left behind when the overall economy starts growing. In your comments, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Senator Reed. Um, and yes, go Rhodey. Um, so uh, I, I think automatic stabilizers are an important tool in our toolkit as we think about uh, how we deal with our economic slowdowns and help families and our, our economy recover. We already have them in terms of SNAP and Medicaid and taxes and our, um, uh, so, you know, they should be part of it. I think UI 
is a natural place for us also to have automatic stabilizers. Obviously, incorporating the differences across the country by geography would be an important part of any design. There are challenges there, but I do think that that's an important place for us. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Reid. I just want to remind uh, senators to please turn on your camera if you are present and intending to speak so that we know that you're there. And I think next up is Senator Cotton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congresswoman Fudge, President Biden and his senior advisors have said that one of his top housing priorities is racial equity, not racial equality. In fact, earlier this week, President Biden used the phrase racial equity at a press availability, but immediately corrected himself to say racial equity. What is the difference between racial equity and racial equality? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. It, from, my, from my own perspective, the difference is that one just means that you treat everybody the same. Sometimes the same is not equitable. You know, if you say to me that um, I'm going to give you five dollars and you're going to give my friend five dollars, my five dollars is not going to necessarily go as far because my friend already has a mother and father who are wealthy and they're giving them. Let's let's just let's do it this way. Home ownership. Let's take it that way. They say, let's make everything equal. But it's not equal because even though I meet all of the qualifications to qualify for home for a loan. You know, I, I've got the, the right credit scores, et cetera, but I don't have down payment money because my parents can't afford to give me down payment. There is no wealth coming to me where most people who are not that don't look like me have options that I do not have. So just to say you treat us all the same is not the same. Equity means making the, the, the playing field level. Sometimes it's not level if you just say, let's just treat everybody the same. Okay, so racial equality means treating everyone the same, correct? Yeah, the same, though, is not always fair. That is correct. So just to be clear, then, it sounds like racial equity means treating people differently based on their race. Is that correct? Not based on race, but it could be best based on economics. It could be based on the history of discrimination that has existed for a long time. Uh, it could be based on educational levels. It could be based on many things, not necessarily just race. Is it ever appropriate for the government to treat people differently based on their race? No. Thank you. I want to uh, return to something that came up with Senator Toomey. Um, you had said last year, September 2020, during the debate about uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's vacancy on the Supreme Court um, in a floor speech, those who are bent on choosing her successor have no decency, they have no honor, they have no integrity. You later said they are a disgrace to this nation. Um, if I recall correctly, Pat Toomey wanted to replace Justice Ginsburg on the bench. Do you believe that Pat Toomey has no decency, has no honor, has no integrity, and is a disgrace to this nation? Sir, first off, I don't really know Senator Toomey. I'm certain that he is not. He seems like a fine man to me. Um, I, your audio cut out there for a moment. I, I, I will say. Me? Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'll say for the record that I believe that Senator Toomey has decency, honor, and integrity. Um, I want to turn to another moment last year in June 2020 and around the debate about policing reform. You said that we have them, them being Republicans, on the run, quite frankly. Right now, the president has Tim Scott trying to come up with a bill, and so they know they must do something, and they know they can't do it without us. So if they want to save face and let this country know that they care even a little bit about people of color, which I don't believe they do, but if they want to try, I want to listen. Uh, Congressman Fudge, do you believe that Tim Scott doesn't care even a little bit about people of color? Tim Scott happens to be a friend. I support and trust Tim Scott. Could you answer my question, please? You said that they care even a little bit about people of color, which I don't believe they do. Uh, that would be referring to Republicans, of which Tim Scott is one. Do you believe he cares even a little bit about people of color? 
he is one, but he's not. I wasn't talking about all Republicans. Tim Scott clearly is is a fine, upstanding senator, and I do believe he cares. Okay, thank you, Congressman Fudge. Um, I could go on. There's a long history of intemperate comments such as this. Obviously, all of us in public life sometimes say things that we hope we could take back. But if you're confirmed, you're going to be serving the needs of many, many Republicans, as well as Democrats and nonpartisan people as well. And I hope that uh, in the future, you can uh, serve them in a way that reflects your best moments in the Congress and not some of these comments. Thank well, you. Well, certainly, I, I thank you. And I do serve people now, Republicans and Democrats, quite well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Senator Menendez. Well, oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'll just make a comment. Uh, you know, if intemperate comments or uh, harsh comments are the standard, uh, I presided and uh, as a member, as the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee over an enormous number of individuals uh, who would have never gotten through the committee and certainly Republicans overwhelmingly voted for them. Uh, and their comments uh, might have been seen in the same context. I understand the nature of political comments uh, at the end of the day. And I believe from everything I have seen of Congresswoman Fudge that she will work for all people, Democrats, Republicans, independents, white, black, brown, uh, Native Americans, and others. Let me just uh, turn to the question of eviction and housing crisis that displaces millions of American families and further destabilizes our country. Uh, as of this month, 2.7 million homeowners are in forbearance plans. As of last month, nearly one in five adult renters were not caught up on rent. And as with any American crisis, the situation is particularly dire for minority communities. Talk about equity uh, and, uh, and those issues. As of last month, 28% of black renters, 24% of Latino renters say they would uh, not, not caught up on their rent compared to only 12% of white renters. So in previous crises, housing counseling has helped families stay in their homes Congresswoman Fudge, do you believe providing additional funding for housing counseling would help prevent evictions and foreclosures in this crisis as well? Thank you so much for the question, Senator. I absolutely do believe that counseling is a major part of assisting people, where, whether it's staying in their homes or continuing to pay their rents. We have programs that are available to people that they are not aware of because we don't provide the resources to make them aware. So counseling should be at the top of our list, especially as we try to work our way out of this crisis. Well, I agree with you very much. As a matter of fact, according to the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, for example, loans to home buyers that receive counseling perform better. And in 2017, 74% of housing counseling clients were people of color. That's why I hope you will, you'll work with me in helping me pass my coronavirus housing Counseling Investment Act, something I think that would help uh, all of our families. Uh, under the last administration, HUD relocated key multifamily housing staff from its office in Newark uh, to the New York Regional Office. As former mayors, we both understand that represents a significant challenge for the over 750 multifamily properties uh, that exist in New Jersey. Um, can uh, you uh, commit to me that you will ensure that the Newark office has the staff it needs and that New Jersey and its interest remains a priority with HUD? Yes, I can commit that to you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Rouse, last week I asked uh, Secretary Yellen about the importance of providing fiscal relief to our state and local government so they can continue to fight the pandemic and keep our essential workers on the job and off the unemployment line. She agreed that now would not be the time to withhold fiscal support from state and local governments. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, Senator. Um, I, I do share Janet Whelan's view, which is that our, our prime focus right now has to be on getting us through this pandemic uh, to get, provide aid to our households, to our businesses, especially small businesses, but also we need to ensure that our state and local governments can be providing for the firefighters, the transit workers, the first responders and our educators as they are stepping up in ways that they would not have budgeted for last year. Um, I would also highlight that in our last, in the great recession, that not providing uh, relief to, well, we provided relief to state and local governments, but it was the job losses there that provided a drag on the recovery. 
And so again, to ensure that we have a swift return back to economic health, um, providing aid to state and local governments is part of that package. Thank you. And finally, Congresswoman uh, Fudge, uh, uh, and I appreciated the visit that we had. Eight years ago, New Jersey faced the, the worst natural disaster in our state's history, Superstorm Sandy, uh, causing havoc throughout the state. Um, and New Jersey families were uh, are now finding themselves, after having traveled the convoluted uh, procedures, uh, where they got some assistance uh, from FEMA to alter and from HUD to rebuild their lives, get the back in, but now finding themselves uh, being caught in a maze in which uh, there is an effort to claw back uh, some of those monies. I hope that you can work with us to provide flexibility to Sandy survivors in New Jersey. Uh, absolutely, Senator, and I appreciate your informing me and giving me up to speed on the on the situation. And if confirmed, it will be one of the early things that I take a look at and be happy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Menendez. Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congresswoman Fudge, um, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity yesterday to, to visit with you. I, I appreciated our conversation. Uh, as I discussed with you at that time, um, I, I had suspected that a number of my colleagues before I had the opportunity to speak would address the issues of some of the statements that you've made in the past. And I'd like to move on to another particular area of concern that I've got that we may very well find some agreement on. And that, and that has to do with our Native Americans and the housing shortages on the reservations. I represent a state, South Dakota, that has nine tribes, all of whom are sovereign and who have a lot of their land in what we call trust or treaty trust tribes. I'd like to draw your attention to a provision of the last omnibus funding bill that I championed that would streamline HUD's section 184 lending program. As I mentioned in our conversation, lending on tribal trust land is a rather difficult process and the HUD 184 loans that are meant to provide mortgage credit where it is scarce can be delayed by a slow exchange of title information between the BIA and HUD. The provision that I led would allow HUD to issue the certificates of guarantee for a 184 loan without waiting for the BIA if the lender originating the loan agrees to indemnify HUD for any losses. This will significantly streamline the program, but HUD will still have to proactively work with the individual lenders and housing organizations that serve Native Americans in order for the Section 184 program to be successful. A lot of them are very local lenders, and they know how to handle a lot of the individuals that are there and the challenges they have on a personal basis in order to get that loan approved. But if confirmed, will you commit to work with me and our Native American stakeholders in South Dakota to making the HUD Section 184 lending program a success? Uh, thank you again, Senator, for meeting with me. Yes, you have my commitment to work with you. I have had the opportunity to reach out to a number of the Native American stakeholders. We've had conversations about some of the issues that you've addressed. Uh, and I know firsthand from having been on a reservation how difficult that situation is. I am wholly supportive of working with you to, to see what we can do to make things better. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rouse. I'd like to thank you also for your willingness to have a, a phone call with us and also for your willingness to, to serve. As I mentioned in our phone conversation, there have been significant economic disparities between states like South Dakota, where social distancing comes naturally, <laughs> and larger, more populated states that have experienced a significant spread of COVID-19. I also understand that your role will involve providing counsel to the president on economic matters. How do you believe future COVID-19 assistance can be targeted for those who need it most, while being mindful of the fact that we're long into the territory of spending money that, well, basically we're gonna be borrowing. And by that, I mean, I know that we talk about uh, state and local governments, but the need and the demand varies a lot from state to state. And trying to target the assistance seems to be a really sensitive issue right now. Can you talk a little bit about how you're planning on balancing your recommendations to the president? recognizing that we still have needs, but also recognizing that every single dollar that we intend to offer is money that we'll be borrowing and probably the next two generations will have to pay back. 
Um, yes, Senator, thank you. And I, I appreciated our conversation yesterday. So if we take a step back and think about the, the purpose of the federal assistance right now, it's that we want to both provide assistance to people today while ensuring that our economy grows so that future generations are better off. So I do best on us more to, is to get us to the other side of this pandemic. Um, and Dr. that Ross, will ensure I, that our economy. Dr. Ross, I apologize. You're cutting out. And so what I would do with the permission of the chair is I'll put this in as a question for the record. And I'll just simply ask sure. if you could get back with me on that particular one. Thank you, Dr. Rouse. Let, let me well, move back to, to, to Congresswoman Fudge for just a second. We didn't have, we did not have the opportunity um, to address this in our conversation yesterday. But one of the major outstanding issues from the 2008 financial crisis is housing finance reform. HUD doesn't have a primary jurisdiction over this matter, but nonetheless, your work on housing will be important in deciding what to do with the GSEs. Are there any thoughts you'd like to share with us as to what should happen with Fannie and Freddie or what an exit from co or conservatorship should look like? Thank you, Senator. You know, the one thing I would say is that one of the things that we have not done uh, as a nation is have a holistic approach to housing. At some point, we need to have a collaborative discussion between FHA, between FHFA, Treasury, HUD. And I, and I would say that this is such a huge issue and has such big implications for the market. We're talking about a $5 trillion business. I believe that just as Congress has chartered these uh, GSEs, it is Congress's ultimate decision as to how they should be handled. I believe that the Congress, that this is such a big issue that Congress should make that decision. Thank you. I look forward Thank to working you. with you on that issue in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rounds. Uh, Senator Tester. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to start by thanking uh, both Congresswoman Fudge and Cecilia Rouse for being here today. I appreciate your willingness to serve. Uh, I, I just want to spin off of, of Senator Rounds' last point, and that is, and, and it's a point you made, Congresswoman Fudge, there are so many times in government, I mean, we were just talking about broadband yesterday, there's four or five agencies that deal with broadband. You just talked about the number of agencies that are dealing with housing. Um, you know very well, being a congressperson, that Congress isn't really renowned for getting things done. Uh, that's why we have the number of executive orders that's gone out over the last few administrations. And uh, I would appreciate, I think you're right, Congress does need to act. But in the meantime, uh, I would appreciate if you can do what you can do to break down the silos in the housing uh, arena in particular. Because I think that's one of the boat anchors on our, on our, on our economy. And in that regard... <clears throat> I wanted to visit with you a little bit about uh, in your position at HUD, uh, what will you do to support uh, affordable workforce housing and rehabilitation? Uh, thank you very much and thank you for our visit. Uh, certainly HUD's mission is to provide housing, low income and affordable housing. Uh, so I su support that mission by saying that we need to expand as we talked about expand housing choice vouchers. It is something that we must do. Uh, we need to uh, find resources to assist with paying rents, with down payments. It, we, we all know that we, when we come out of this crisis, whenever that is, people are not gonna just be able to say, you know, I'm 14 months behind in, in rent and I can just pay it all back right now. We know that is not going to happen. And so we have to come up with a cohesive policy to allow people to know that the government is going to be assisting them. And we have many ways to do it. I mean, certainly FHA comes within the control uh, under the jurisdiction, uh, but the others don't. But I, again, believe that the only way that we solve any of these problems is to do it through interagencies, to talk about what that policy should be. And that is the only way we solve these issues is to come together and agree. Okay, also spinning off of, thank you, also spinning off of Senator Rounds' comment on Indian country, I would hope that you have somebody in HUD, if you're confirmed, have somebody in HUD that is able to deal with the, the myriad of programs uh, that impact Indian housing because it's incredibly deficient. Senator Booker was on earlier today and we have a conversation about uh, poverty in, in inner cities and poverty with large land-based Indian tribes. They're both significant problems, and I hope that you have somebody in your agency 
that's willing to work with the BIA to make sure that we get some housing built in Indian country, because quite frankly, it is uh, massively deficient. You don't need to respond to that. Be, uh, just, just do that. If you could, if you're confirmed. Uh, I have, uh, my last question is for Cecilia Rao. Cecilia, and I should have said this was Congressman Blake's. Thank you for meeting with us. Uh, I appreciate the conversation we have. We're in the middle of a pandemic, which has caused the economy to uh, go into a, a recession, a depression, some will say. Depends on what area of business you're in. I, I want to know your perspective as we're talking about borrowed money, and it's been talked about a lot, and it's certainly a concern to me. But I want to know your perspective on on how we spend money right now, especially if it's borrowed, to move, as you said, to move uh, the country out of uh, you know a, a potential decline into economic growth again. Um, uh, thank you, Senator. I, and I'm, I'm, I apologize for my connection. I'm trying with an earpiece now. Um, so I, I do believe that the sh best way for us to get back on solid economic footing is by getting through this pandemic. And that means supporting households, supporting businesses, especially small businesses, supporting our state and local government. Um, if we don't, we run the risk of actually finding ourselves in a downward spiral because the, the capacity to deal with our debt is not only the amount that we spend, but the size of our economy. And if we wanna keep our economy going, we need to be spending some money. So I believe we have to be in doing smart investments as we come out of this that have economic returns, such as those in investment, uh, infrastructure, R&D, education, so that we, again, put our economy on a strong footing so that it is growing and there for future generations. And I assume when you say smart investments, you're saying the monies that are appropriated by Congress need to be targeted. They need to be targeted. They need to be smart. They need to be in those areas where we know that the economic benefit outweighs the cost. Thank you both. For your, thank you both for your willingness to serve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Tester. Senator Tillis. Um, thank you, Chairman Toomey and incoming Chairman uh, Brown. Uh, and thanks to Congresswoman Rouse and Dean <clears throat> excuse me for being here uh, and congratulations to your family congresswoman I, I love seeing my mom in the background I'm glad yours is there too uh, real quick question for you congresswoman um, congresswoman fudge I should say um, the uh, do you recognize the backlog of the pending HUD code changes passed by the manufacturing uh, manufactured housings uh, consensus committee do you recognize those as things that need to be fixed yes sir I do and uh, on a related note, Congresswoman, I, I remember when I was Speaker of the House down in North Carolina, I met with a town that was in my district, and it was on affordable housing, which I supported significantly in North Carolina. Um, now, about 45 minutes went on things that we could do to produce affordable housing. Then they requested that I support a bill that would mandate a, a sprinkler in single family housing for fire suppressant. Uh, which for a hundred thousand dollar home would increase the cost of the home by about fifteen thousand dollars. It really made me start thinking about barriers to affordable housing that could potentially be an overreach in certain communities. I had this discussion with uh, Dr. Carson about you know when we have to prioritize limited funds for affordable housing. What are your thoughts on potentially looking at jurisdictions that have a need for affordable housing, but may have overreached on the barriers to that purely through regulatory overreach? As a means for kind of prioritizing where we put these limited dollars to address affordable housing problems. Well, thank you for the question, Senator. I, I think everything is on the table. I mean, we have to look at regulations. We also have to look at safety. Uh, we have to be sure that if we want to put people in housing, we have to do it in the most efficient, effective, and safe way. So I believe all of those things are on the table and would be something that I'd happy, be happy to discuss with you and take a good look at. Well, thank you. If confirmed, I'd like to talk about things that we absolutely have to regulate to make sure that, that people have a safe home, uh, but maybe you let the regulatory burden in certain jurisdictions be instructive towards grants and other things that they may be eligible for. Uh, so again, Congresswoman Rouse, uh, Congresswoman Fudge and family, congratulations on your nomination. And Congresswoman, thank you for your, your service, longtime service to your community. 
Uh, Dean Morales, I've got a question. Um, you know, before COVID hit, we had an economy that I think by most measures was moving in the right direction. And I believe that a part of that were some of the tax cuts and jobs act, not all of it, uh, there, there are other factors, but were a significant contributing factor to the economic growth. Uh, we understand that uh, President Biden is going to propose tax increases and particularly corporate tax increases. What is, what is your position on how we um, move forward and best position our economy to grow as we continue to make progress on the vaccine and reopen the economy? Do, do you think an increase in corporate taxes is called for? Senator Tillis, you've, um, uh, thank you for that question that you've really landed on an important question, which is that we understand that now in order to get to the other side of the pandemic, we need to, the federal government needs to step in. But as we get to the other side and get back on the path for economic growth, I think it is important that we look at the federal budget in totality and think about the important investments that we need to make in order to improve economic growth but also understand how are we going to pay for those investments now. And um, so I believe we should be taking a comprehensive look at that. Uh, the president has committed and saying that he wants to look at array of tax options, but that he believes that, that individuals and corporations should pay their fair share. So this is not to say that there's just an automatic repeal of the, the tax credits uh, that were passed before, but we need to look at the most important ways that we can both raise revenue in the most economically efficient way possible, but that ensuring that everybody is paying their fair share. Uh, thank you. Well, I'll be submitting questions for the record uh, to both of you. Thank you very much. And again, congratulations on your nominations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Senator Warner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. and. Uh, Incoming Chair Brown, um, congratulations to the both the nominees. I've enjoyed our conversations uh, together. Um, I'm going to direct most of my my comments this morning to Dr. Rouse, uh, but as Congresswoman Fudge knows, I've, uh, particularly on housing finance reform, this is an issue that is extraordinarily important to me, and I look forward to revisiting it uh, with you once you're confirmed. Um, Dr. Rouse, you'll. One of the things that came out of the first CARES package that I think was extraordinarily significant long term uh, was that um, when we did the expansion of unemployment, um, there were two component parts, as we all know. One part, the $600 a week uh, plus up, which was relatively controversial. Um, the other part that I think there was broad based support for was the expansion to cover self employed, gig workers, independent contractors, a whole host of, of folks. As, We've discussed that universe of workers um, and that type of work is not going away. Um, I think it's terribly important that we have a social contract that includes all forms of work. I, I hope there will be a, a further expansion of benefits to those workers and, and including a, a component of portability, something that I've worked with members on the committee on for a long time. But can you speak to um, how we continue, sticking with unemployment to start, how we continue uh, this commitment to unemployment in, in this expanded basis. Obviously, it was continued uh, in, in the December uh, COVID package. I was proud of that. Um, but at some point, it can't be an entirely federal government obligation. We've got to have those payors kicking in as well. But uh, can you speak to your goals on how we make sure unemployment covers all forms of work? Senator, I share your interest and commitment to this issue. And in fact, I will say it's part of what draws me to this uh, potential opportunity. And I think it is part of the better part of Build Back Better. And that is to recognize that much of our social contract, as uh, you describe it, was designed in the 1930s. It was designed for a labor contract that, or a relationship between workers and their employers is very different than what we have today. So if we take our UI system, for example, um, today the system is not providing the kind of safety net that it used to do. Um, many workers are not covered. I think it's less than half of workers are actually covered. Uh, the replacement rate has been falling. Um, it was designed for short-term unemployment spells. And what we're observing in our most recent recessions is that unemployment spells are getting, becoming longer and our UI system was not designed to help there. 
Um, and yet we know that for both to help workers get through and for economic stability, UI plays an important part of that role. So I, I share your view. I, I, I look forward to working with you and others. I think that broadening the base of workers that are, that are covered um, is important, whether that's through portable benefits, whether that's for how we classify workers. There are many options that are on the table. And if confirmed, I would want to work with my team and with, with all of you to find ways to what I will call modernize our UI system and modernize other parts of our, our safety net so that it reflects and honors the changing nature of work in our in our economy. Well, thank you. Let me quickly get in my, my next question, which is um, um, we want to make sure this economic recovery is equitable. Uh, again, I think we took a, a major step forward and want to thank so many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, particularly my um, folks like Tim Scott and, and, and Mike Crapo, when we included the Jobs and Neighborhood Investment Act in the last, uh, in, in the last um, uh, COVID package, which puts $12 billion into CDFIs and MDIs. Senator Brown has been a big advocate uh, of this, Congressman Fudge on the House side, making sure there was equitable access to capital. Um, we've got to make sure we implement that program right because we clearly saw black and brown businesses get disproportionately hurt. Um, by COVID and, and implementing that that program is going to correctly is going to be really important. Another component is is the fact that you know in the Great Recession we saw three quarters of the jobs that were lost uh, were jobs that only required high school education. Coming forward, we're seeing that you know three quarters of the jobs that are being created require a college based education. Uh, we can attack that at the student debt level, but we can also attack it on incentives to have businesses start investing in human capital. You and I have talked about the uh, the idea of changing our tax and accounting treatment of businesses that invest in human capital. And um, you may want to take this for the record because my my question, I've used up all my time and I, I won't ask you to give a full launch there. I think John Kennedy's waiting anxiously, but I hope you, you know, I know we've talked about this before, but I hope we can really continue this conversation on an equitable economic recovery. We'd Thank be you, happy Senator. to do so. Thank you. Th thank you, Senator Warner, for respecting the clock. Senator Kennedy. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Congresswoman, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay. Uh, first, uh, it's an honor to meet you. My pleasure. Um, I, I don't want to put too fine a point on this, but uh, it's important to me personally to 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 uh, clear up the confusion that that. I have from your answer to, to one of uh, um, Chairman Toomey's questions. I, I think it is accurate that you did say at one point that uh, Republicans don't care about people of color even a little bit. And I'd like to know if you if you truly believe that. I also, Senator, thank you. Um, I also said that if they do, I'd be happy to listen. And I'm certainly always willing to listen to not only my constituents, but my colleagues. Uh, and I would suggest to you very, very strongly that there has never been a time in my entire public service career that I have not supported and worked with all people. And I commit to you, I will do just that if I am fortunate enough to be confirmed for this position. Yes, ma'am. But I, 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 again, not to put too uh, fine a point on this, but I, I, I need, I, I need a, a, a little more precise answer. So let me, let me ask it a little more directly. Do you think Republicans care about people of color? I do some, yes. Do you think most Republicans care about people of color? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Dean, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, thank you. Okay, um, it's an honor to meet you too. I, I wanna take you back um, to the month before the pandemic started before we even knew about the pan, the, the uh, coronavirus. Um, what, 
what tax changes, if any, would you have made uh, at that point in time, given the fact that we know taxes impact the economy? If generally speaking, if you tax something, you get less of it. S Senator, I, I believe what you're referring to is the fact that before the pandemic uh, struck or we identified the virus, um, the economy overall was doing uh, relatively well. If we had been, we had been, we were in an expansion, unemployment rates were low. Right, right. but um, I'm, running out, and, I'm running out of time. So, so if, it, it, what tax it, changes it, at that point would you have made to the economy? So, so Senator, um, if you will, one of the problems, though, with our economy at that time is we still had inequality that were that was at I would say record levels, except for the fact that it's been exacerbated now. It, yes, so I still what, would. What tax changes would you? I'm sorry, I have to do this because I only got a minute and thirty seconds. What tax changes at that time would you have made to the economy? So, Senator, I would have been looking for ways and strategies for us to be addressing income inequality and wealth inequality, which existed at those at that time. How, how would pandemic? You how would you have done that? Well, I so I I'm an economist and I study things. I would be you know I would want to look at a broad array of potential options. Um, and if President Biden, when President Biden is ready to consider the the options for paying for his investments, which we know will help improve and grow the economy. Um, we will study and try to impose taxes in the most efficient way, but where what, individuals what, what or corporations your, are paying their fair share. Your, sorry for interrupting. I hate doing that, but we are limited by time. What are the options that you're talking about? So we can look at our, our income tax rates. We can look at our corporate tax rate. We can look at um, ways to deal uh, with wealth uh, income tax. Um, capital uh, gains? Would you, would you, uh, is capital gains on your so, list? So capital gains are tricky because we know that the way that we currently treat capital gains is also generate some inefficiencies. Um, and so there, um, you know, there, there's tricky ways that we can deal with capital gains, but I think that we should look at all of the options. Absolutely. Because we have, we have wealth inequality in this country, which is wide tax? and getting wider. In my last nine seconds, how about the death tax? So, Senator, I believe that we should be studying and considering all of these different options and to put together a portfolio, which is most effective for addressing wealth and income inequality in this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Warren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and congratulations to both of you on your nominations. Thank you for being here with us. We live in an America today where a typical white family has eight times the wealth of a typical black family and five times the wealth of a typical Latinx family. Gaps that haven't budged in decades. Now, Dr. Rouse, you have done important research on racial and economic equity throughout your career. Could you tell us what it would mean for American families and for our economy if we pursued policies that closed the racial wealth gap substantially? Um, Senator, Senator Warren, I think we share a concern about the increasing wealth gap. And I think if we step back and first consider why wealth is important and why the racial wealth gap or any wealth gap is important, first, that wealth represents a cumulative impact of inherited resources, right? It's income over one's lifetime and uh, expenses incurred. It's a reflection of family circumstances. It can be luck, um, but it also reflects obstacles in the labor and financial markets. And so the black-white wealth gap in particular uh, can be attributed to a history of discriminatory policies such as redlining. And importantly, this legacy continues to replicate itself generation to generation as those without accumulated wealth cannot pass it on to their children. The second part of why I believe it's important is that these differences are consequential. So wealth is, a, is protective and is important for well-being. So increased wealth has been associated with better health outcomes and better financial resilience. And during this pandemic, what we've seen is that those with greater wealth had more resources to fall upon when the economy slowed. So it provides a kind of self-insurance against economic adversity. It also provides access to housing in safe neighborhoods with good schools, which confers additional advantages on those who can afford such opportunities. And so closing the gap, wealth gap is not about trying to literally take away, but it's trying to ensure that everybody can participate in this economy. 
Yeah. Well, that's powerfully important. Thank you. And you know, one big contributor to the wealth gap is student loan debt. Black and Latinx students borrow more money to go to college and they have a harder time paying it off. If the president canceled up to $50,000 in student loan debt, as Leader Schumer and I have called for, it would close the racial wealth gap among people with student loan debt by about 25 points. Canceling $50,000 in federal student loan debt is the single biggest thing the administration could do on its own to narrow the racial wealth gap. So I hope we'll get a chance to work together to make this happen. I want to turn to another piece of the racial wealth gap, and that is home ownership. Owning a home is the number one way that middle class families build wealth. But here's the ugly truth. The racial home ownership gap is now wider than it was when Congress outlawed housing discrimination back in the mid 1960s. And this difference can be traced directly to decades of racist federal policies, including redlining that denied black families the same path to home ownership that was available to white families. Since the government created this problem, it seems only right that the government should help fix it. So Congresswoman Fudge, you've spent your career working to improve the lives of people in communities of color. If the federal government provided help with down payment for families living in formerly redlined neighborhoods, would that make a difference in narrowing the racial home ownership gap and the racial wealth gap? Thank you very much, Senator. It would make a huge difference because that is the biggest impediment to home ownership for communities of color is the down payment. We meet all of the other qualifications. And so it's like us being in a race with people who have already had a head start because we don't have a mother or father to give us a down payment. We don't have the wherewithal, the same kind of income, the same kind of access. And so it is like we are starting out of the blocks with somebody who was out ahead, ahead of us by 100 yards. Down payment assistance is a major, major uh, impediment. And if we can fix that, you would see a tremendous growth because no matter what they say, home ownership amongst Blacks right now is the same as it was in 1968. Yep. yep. So thank you, Congresswoman. You're very powerful on this. We need to take action before the pandemic widens the home ownership gap even more. You know, it's time for an all hands on deck approach to tackling the shameful racial disparities in our economy. Providing down payment assistance is one powerful way to do that. Administratively canceling billions of dollars of student loan debt is another. I know you both care deeply about these issues and I'm looking forward to working with you in your new roles. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Warren. Thank you. Senator Schatz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member. Um, thank you to our nominees. I want to start with uh, Congresswoman Fudge. Uh, we had a great conversation the other day, and I wanted to follow up um, on something I feel very passionately about. A straight line can be drawn from the racist uh, local, state, and federal segregation policies of the past to our zoning codes today. And so, in addition to recommending uh, recommitting to fair housing enforcement, what should HUD do to encourage communities to abandon exclusionary zoning and implement policies that build accessible, equitable, and affordable housing? Well, I think, thank you, Senator, and I did very much enjoy our conversation. We have to get rid of this notion of not in my backyard. We're going to have to find ways for two reasons. One is housing has increased by 10% or more a year. And the average person that we're talking about that HUD serves are people who are not, their incomes are not rising at that level. So we're going to have to, to find some incentives for home builders, especially those that, that build multifamily housing, to assist us in these communities to change the zoning laws. I mean, some of these are very, very um, discriminatory, and I think that there are some legal options, but I also think we need to convince them that it is to their advantage economically. It is to their advantage to make sure that their communities know that it is important to them to get people off the street and to house people properly in safe, affordable uh, neighborhoods. Zoning is a tough issue. Being a mayor, I understand it, but it is an educational issue and we need to make sure that we educate them on it. 
what they are doing to their communities. Well, thank you for that. And I'm looking forward to working with you on this. And I'll just add that part of this is the politics of, of, of cities and towns and people who otherwise consider themselves uh, rather progressive uh, get rather regressive and uh, don't are, are not reminded by people such as you and, and, and many of the people uh, on the banking committee and in the Congress that uh, the exclusionary zoning, restrictive covenants, all of that is the great grandson of Jim Crow. Um, and, and, and we need to remember that legacy um, even as all of these progressives were, were, were fighting for progressive causes except for housing next to their block. And that's something that we have to wrap our minds around, not just from a policy perspective, but from a community and communications perspective. And I'm hoping uh, that we can work together on that. So if I'm confirmed, I will be talking with you about it all the time, Senator. Great. Um, last Congress, I introduced a CDBGDR reform bill that would permanently authorize the program and get funding to communities faster to help communities develop uh, housing focused community resilience plans. Uh, do you support the permanent authorization of CDBG DR? Yes, very, very much. And I will be happy if confirmed to work with you on it. That's the only way we can get it out without jumping through a million hoops. Thank you very much. And uh, Hawaii has one of the worst uh, housing shortages uh, in the United States. We have uh, San Francisco, New York prices and, and Midwestern salaries. Uh, and so um, uh, do I have your commitment to work, uh, generally speaking, uh, on the housing shortage in Hawaii and specifically uh, on the Native Hawaiian housing uh, challenge and the Native Hawaiian housing block grant? Very much. I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Rouse, uh, uh, there's a real sort of shift in thinking around the economics of climate action. And, I'm, I, and I think that this thinking is happening in academia. It's certainly happening in markets as we see, and it's happening in the Congress. And I'm wondering how you see your role in, to, in developing the data sets that sort of um, uh, flesh out the case that climate action is not just uh, not in conflict with an economic strategy, but it is in fact um, our economic strategy. And I'm wondering how you're gonna develop the data sets to clarify that so we don't have to have this sort of 1970s argument about whether we're gonna protect the environment or, or develop the economy. Senator, I can assure you that the, the addressing our climate challenge is front and center of the administration's agenda and of the CEA. First and foremost, we will have uh, an economist, one of our members, and we're hiring another economist uh, should I be confirmed at least, um, that will focus on climate and understanding the true costs of climate inaction, understanding the benefits of addressing climate and how we can do so efficiently are, are, prime, are, are key to what I'd like to accomplish at the CEA, should I be confirmed. Thank you, Senator Schatz. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on the nominations, uh, both to you, Congresswoman uh, Fudge and Dr. Rouse. Dr. Rouse, let me start with you, and I appreciate both of you having uh, conversations with me. But Dr. Rouse, let me start with you, and, and as you can imagine, it, it's surrounding the hospitality industry and tourism industry because Nevada has been so hard hit. Our resort operators support our whole community, but as you and I discuss, when people are willing to travel during a pandemic, it has a devastating impact on our economy, both uh, on the businesses and the workers that directly and indirectly uh, support it. And, and let me just throw out some numbers here because I think this is important for us to understand. Before the pandemic, the travel and tourism industry was one of the largest sectors of the economy. In 2019, travel generated 1.1 trillion in spending and supported 15.8 million American jobs. But we know because of the COVID pandemic, it has devastated this industry. And according to Oxford Economics, the U.S. lost $510 billion in travel spending and 4.5 million travel jobs in 2020. So my question to you is, do you think that the industry, the hospitality, the travel leisure industry is one area where Congress and the administration uh, should focus when crafting a stimulus bill? 
Uh, Senator, I appreciated our conversation and I share your concern about the travel and leisure industries. We know from the most recent job report that that is an area where we're seeing our most significant job losses and where they have been hardest hit by this pandemic. And as I have said before, getting through this pandemic uh, where as safely as possible, where we're helping individuals, helping the businesses that are viable get to the other side so that they can, that they can participate in, um, in the growth is very important. And I, I believe we should be targeting our assistance at those hardest hit areas. I believe the president shares that priority. Uh, I, I would say that in the, the rescue plan, right, there is additional aid for businesses, but I would look forward to talking with you and understanding what from your perspective and your constituents' perspective would be the most effective ways to ensure that we get the assistance to those businesses and those sectors that are the most heavily impacted by the pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Ross, because I do for look forward to working with you. Senator Kramer and I both introduced this bipartisan bill, the Hospitality and Commerce Job Recovery Act. And uh, we have ideas after working with our industry uh, locally and nationally about what can be done. That includes tax credits to be effective tools to incentivize spending and, and help certain sectors recover from an economic crisis. So I look forward to talking with you uh, on that subject. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman Fudge, let me, um, let me, uh, 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 associate with myself with some of the comments that Senator Scott um, brought forward with respect to manufactured housing. Uh, he and I both um, co-chaired a bill, the Housing uh, Manufactured Housing Modernization Act. It was passed into law. Um, it was uh, passed into law a year ago and uh, to my understanding has still not been implemented by HUD. Uh, as a result of that, he and I sent a letter to then Secretary Carson February 4th, uh, asking for the quick implementation uh, of the new law. And, and really what it does is it issues guidance for the inclusion of manufactured housing in states and local governments consolidated plans. So I would look forward to working with you and the implementation uh, of that particular law, but I only have so much time. Let me talk about one other area that we all have been addressing, which is the affordable housing crisis in Nevada across the country. It, it is it is so prevalent. One area, though, is youth homelessness. Nevada's third in the nation for the total number of unaccompanied youth experiencing homelessness and the highest rate of unsheltered, unaccompanied uh, homeless youth. So, uh, and I know this is an area that is important for you as well. What ideas do you have to work with other agencies to reduce the, the youth homelessness and what can HUD be doing as well? Thank you very much, Senator. and I did enjoy a conversation. Thank you. Um, certainly, if I'm confirmed, one of the things that we need to address right away is youth who are aging out of the foster care system. Uh, as soon as they age out, they have no place to go. So HUD has to start to put in place programs to allow them to, uh, to stay in public housing, at least until we can get them on their feet. But right now, it is a very difficult situation with the numbers of young people who are, as you say, unattended, but the majority of them are foster children. So we need a program for foster youth. And it's something that I would be happy to work with you on, uh, should I be confirmed. I look forward to it. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cortez Masto. Senator Smith. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chair Toomey and uh, Chair to be Brown. And um, welcome to our nominees. You both bring such distinguished records and um, I know a true spirit of public service. So I'm really grateful for the conversations that I was able to have with both of you um, over the last couple of weeks. And I very much look forward to supporting you. You know, we are in the midst of the worst public health crisis and economic crisis together colliding in our country that we have, in my knowledge, ever lived through. But I really appreciate how both of you are talking about how we need to navigate through this crisis, um, but also focus on how we can expand on the, um, the ingenuity and the innovation and the amazing um, work of American workers to be able to build our economy forward. Um, I want to just, uh, Dr. Rouse, I want to start with you. I really appreciated our conversation and your thoughtfulness and your reasonableness. And I appreciate especially how you talk about following the data, not just the averages, but the entire scope of data that will help us understand how people are doing at the extremes of our economy, as well as how people on the average are doing. And this gets to a question that Senator Warren was raising that I think is so important. It is the cost 
of inequality to our economy. And Elizabeth touched on this with regard to home ownership, but I want to ask you about the the challenges to our economy because of lack of access to capital uh, for uh, communities of color, black and brown and indigenous communities, and especially the role that CDFIs and native CDFIs can play in expanding access to capital, the impact that can have on inequality and getting our economy really moving again. Uh, thank you, Senator. You're raising a very um, important issue as we as we think about having a shared recovery and bringing uh, ensuring that it's not just the average that does well, but everywhere and the diversity. It's not. Uh, I, I want to just emphasize that geographic diversity and what happens in our rural areas, in particular, and for our hardest hit areas, is, is an important part of that mosaic. And um, we know that e stimulating economic activity is the best way to generate uh, employment for rural areas um, and therefore economic security and livelihood and to ensure that the young people want to stay in those areas, not that people have to be forced to stay where they don't want to stay, but that they have an incentive to stay and not to flee to urban areas in order to find a job. So if we want to bring back vibrancy to all of the areas of the US, we have to ensure that are the businesses and the smaller businesses have access to capital so they can get started. And importantly, during a downturn such as this, that they have access to capital so they can thrive during an economic activity and bridge to make sure that they ensure and they survive to the other side. So I, I believe this is an important part of our strategy. I appreciate that. And when you and I met, we talked about what this could look like in uh, Indian country in uh, the United States. And I want to uh, re-extend my invitation to uh, have you come to Minnesota, either virtually or in person, so that we can have some conversations about what that would mean in terms of access to capital and economic development um, in, in tribal lands. Um, so, and let me turn to uh, Representative Fudge uh, just to carry on this theme. I so appreciate you and your, uh, your leadership. And I also just want to note that as a mayor, I think that mayors uh, know a little bit about mayors. Um, no problem is too big or too small for a mayor to focus on. And also most problems when you're a mayor are not Republican or Democratic problems. They're problems to, about whether people's lives work or not. I believe that you'll bring that same spirit uh, to um, housing and urban development. So I want to thank you. And um, I want to ask follow up specifically on a conversation that you and I also had about the shortage of housing on tribal lands. And would ask if you could just comment briefly on um, Nahasda, which is the most important housing program for tribal uh, and tribal land Indian country, and, and what role you see that can play in addressing the how to shortage um, um, in tribal communities. Well, thank you very, very much, and thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Nahasda is something that was brought up to me by most of the Native American stakeholders that I've already spoken with. It's something that I have guaranteed them that I am going to look into as quickly as possible. Um, and as soon as I can, uh, if I'm confirmed, as soon as I can get in the office and talk to the staff and figure out what's going on with it, I promise that I'll get back with you as well as I promised them that I'd get back with them. And I intend to do just that. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, I have a question for the record, which I will submit for Representative Fudge about the importance of maintenance and safety needs in uh, public housing. Um, this relates to the tragedy that in Minnesota with uh, terrible fire and the lack of sprinkler systems. You can get back to me on that, Representative Fudge. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, it's my understanding that Senator Van Hollen may be attempting to log on, uh, but I, he has not been able to do so yet. Senator Brown, um, if you had a closing comment you wanted to make, maybe you could make that statement now and we could give a little bit more time for Senator Van Hollen to join us in, in case he's able to do so. I, I would. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for, again, to um, my friend, Congressman Fudge and uh, Dr. Rouse, thank you. Let me, let me say in response to the questions from a number of my colleagues, it's pretty tough to take to, to Congressman Fudge. It's pretty tough to take a a lecture on political speech from members of a party whose leader just three weeks ago literally incited a violent insurrection with his words. The real rhetoric we should be worried about are the lies and the conspiracy theories that do more than hurt feelings. They make they incite violence, they undermine our democracy. I, I know Senator Toomey at least has pushed back against the former president's dangerous lies about our election. 
I appreciate his candor and his courage. I wish others of our colleagues on this committee and in the Senate would show the same kind of courage. Thanks to Congresswoman Fudge. Thanks to uh, Dean Rouse, Dr. Rouse, for your thoughtful answers. I, I'm excited to work with you. This committee made me even more excited about assuming the chairmanship. This, this hearing today made me even more excited about assuming the chairmanship um, of this committee. I, I appreciated Congresswoman Fudge's comments that these are extraordinary times that require extraordinary action. Uh, what you two will do in the next several years will be the most, I would assume, will be the most important things you've ever done in your lives. I consider my job to be that in the, in the few years ahead. Um, your service to our country is both admirable and absolutely crucial. So um, thank, thank you, Chairman, to Chairman Toomey, and thanks to our two witnesses. Thank you, Senator Brown. Let me just uh, briefly observe, I, I appreciate the conversation today. I'm grateful uh, to the two witnesses for their willingness to serve our country. Um, I, I will say, I think I heard bipartisan discussion about the fact that we are in a different place in our economy today than we were back in March. And today, we've got people who are certainly suffering from very terrible circumstances, but it is a much more targeted group of folks than the sort of universal catastrophe we faced in March. And so I hope that as we develop further responses, it will, it will reflect that reality. So this concludes the question and answer portion of today's hearing. Prior to adjourning, I do have some final housekeeping announcements. Before I do that, again, let me thank uh, both of our witnesses, uh, our nominees, for your testimony and for your willingness to serve. For senators, all follow-on questions for the record must be submitted by 5 p.m. Saturday, January 30th. That is 5 p.m. Saturday, January 30th. And for our witnesses, I do ask you to respond to written questions that you receive by noon, Monday, February the 1st. I know that is a very tight time frame, but your prompt responses will facilitate this committee quickly processing uh, your nominations. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.